Um, bonjour à toutes et à tous, bienvenue à Auckland. Nous sommes ravis de vous accueillir pour cette communication principale de Sophie Van Nisch. And to introduce it, uh, introduce the session, it is my pleasure to welcome Stéphane Rey, who is the Conseiller de Coopération d'Action Culturelle, or the Head of the Scientific and Cultural Office at the French Embassy. He has been in New Zealand since 2017, uh, and he has also in another life been a porte lettre moderne, so he is very close to the interests of this group. Um, Stéphane supported this conference right from the very beginning, and he generously agreed to support the tournée uh, that Sophie Van Nisch was going to do around the country, talking to the Alliance. Uh, and of course that couldn't happen due to COVID, but we are very grateful for his support. Uh, and particularly, I would like to say a special welcome to anyone from the Alliance in New Zealand who is joining us this morning. Um, in a minute, I'll hand it over to Stefan, and after that, there'll be just a short introductory comment from Peter McPhee, who is one of the key Rude um, Society members. He's Professor Emeritus at the University of Melbourne. Uh, and I should add too that the, uh, the Rude Society always has a special meeting uh, around Bastille Day. So Bastille Day is, is always part of the Rude seminar and it's appropriate uh, this morning uh, that Sophie is giving this uh, talk from Paris in the evening on Bastille Day. So over to you, Stefan. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Kirsty. Uh, good evening, good afternoon, good uh... Uh, morning. It depends where you are in the world. I'm very happy to be here with you. Uh, it's a huge event, and um, indeed, it's a, it's a bit strange if we think that we started working on that event like two years ago. And of course, we wouldn't know at that time that uh, it would become a digital event. But I'm very grateful, and I would like first to give a big thank to Massey University for all their their great job to maintain these these events. Uh, indeed, yesterday night, we had a small celebration here, uh, celebrating the Bastille Day, the 14 juillet, uh, in Wellington. Uh, I'm aware how privileged we are to be in New Zealand and to be able to gather and to have a real event, whereas almost everywhere in the world there were digital events, indeed, because it's not possible to have uh, people because of the COVID-19. And uh, it was as well a special event because we decided to give a special tribute to the medical frontline workers. We were very active and we still are uh, all over the world. So it shows at the same time that this special day of Bastille Day, this 14 juillet, has always had a very special meaning uh, for us and how it's constantly reinterpreted and revisited uh, a long time. And that's why I'm particularly happy to welcome today uh, Sophie. Uh, it's a huge pleasure. We would have liked to have you physically present and to be able to travel in New Zealand, uh, thanks to our, our network, uh, especially for Alliance Francaise. But at least you are digitally with us, and I'm looking forward to hearing your keynote presentation. And uh, I'm happy to give the floor now to Peter Maxi. Thanks a lot. Sophie uh, Vanish is a directrice de recherche at the CNRS in Paris. She's made major contributions to our understanding of the French Revolution and its legacy. Among her many sole and joint authored books and collections, we might single out her first book, L'Impossible Citoyen, 1997, an analysis of the notion of foreigner in the discourse of the revolution, and La Liberté ou la Mort, published in English in 2012 as In Defense of the Terror, Liberty or Death in the French Revolution. This book argues that the institution of terror, um, that the institution of terror needs to be understood as um, a process welded to a regime of popular sovereignty, the only alternatives being to defeat tyranny or die for liberty. Much of Sophie's work has been concerned with the history of emotions and the place of collective memories in civic identity. Sophie Vanish is also a committed public intellectual. Among other activities, she's a member of the editorial board of the political and cultural journal Vakam. She's also involved in various organizations concerned with the public uses of the past in contemporary life and politics. She's been on the vigilance committee regarding public uses and misuses of history and memorials, 
for example, in what she sees as the co-option of images of the French Revolution by the extreme right during the recent protests of the Gilets Jaunes. She's frequently been directly involved in political campaigns and public presentations on contemporary civic life. Before passing over to Sophie, allow me to point to an important personal thread that links her to these Rude seminars. In 1978, the first biennial George Rude seminar was held in George's honor at the University of Melbourne. We're now participating in the 22nd. George Rude's great books, especially The Crowd and the French Revolution, have been deservedly influential. His personal influence in Australia and elsewhere was profound. George was a charming and generous man whose friendship was widely valued and whose decade in Australia and frequent visits thereafter created mm. a rich legacy. George's final visit to Australia coincided with that of his friend, Michel Vauvel, to the sixth George Rude seminar in 1988 in the build up to the bicentennial celebrations of 1989. It was an encounter that was both very moving and profoundly sad with obvious signs of the decline of George's health. He died aged 82 in 1993. At that time, Sophie Vanish was completing her doctoral thesis under the supervision of Michelle Vauvel. I'm now delighted to ask Sophie to present uh, today's keynote address on emotions, democracy and the laboratory of the French Revolution, 1789 to 1796. Welcome, Sophie. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter Maxi. Well, uh, first, first of all, uh, I would like, um, I'm not sure it's okay. It sounds okay. It's okay. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Kirsty Carpenter for inviting me to present this conference two years ago long before we had to deal with the coronavirus. Thank you, Kirsty, for your perseverance, situational awareness, and inventive abilities to make a difference. And thank you for caring for this conference with all the kindness that is your hallmark. Thanks to Dominique Cabrera and Pierre Scholler for making the filmed images you are about to see and making them available to us. Thanks to the French Embassy, to Massey University, for providing funding and support for a trip that was unfortunately cancelled. Thank you to the scientific institutions organizing this conference, Georges Rudet Seminar in French History and Civilization, and particularly to Peter Macri, Society for French Historical Studies, and Aid France. My gratitude goes especially to David K. Smith, a great perfectionist and so generous with his time. Capturing, directing, take care of emotions in democracy, the revolutionary laboratory, 1789-1795. The emergence of the history of emotions is one of the fields that has most upset our perception and practice of the French Revolution's history. You hear the recurring question in every seminar and every lecture since John Scott has been promoting the category of gender in history. That question is, how have you taken this gender issue into account? And it is a question that can't be ignored. Perhaps there will be even come a time when the necessary question for any historical investigation becomes, how do you analyze the emotional variables in your survey? The anthropologists I work with have long been interested in this question and have incorporated it into their analytical approach. This is especially so New Zealand where, in recent times, scholars, mostly Maori, here, expressional cultures are exchanged, often with significant passion or emotion, like the Aka, which, calling upon the deities, as well as Tupuna, 
incorporates expressive gesture that ward of any threat of death that falls around and protect the life of the group, first leading it to victory. As it is often the case, this field of the history of emotions has unfolded from different perspectives in the Anglo Saxon and Francophone worlds. In the mid 1990s, in the English speaking world, William Reddy produced his measure and very influential work, The Navigation of Feeling. It focuses on the individual who, depending on the cultural and political situation, is more or less free in his emotion navigation, i.e. more or less free of the normative group or the normative rules imposed by the authorities. In fact, it scrutinizes the emotional freedom, i.e. societies where the social and political hold of the individual is weak, and it uses the approaches of cognitive psychology to suggest paths for historical interpretations. In France, the history of emotions in revolutionary times inherits the history of mentalities and it struggles against the theory stemming from the crowd psychology of Hippolyte, then Gustave Le Bon, and Sigmund Freud. In 1988, Jacques Revel republished two texts by George Lefebvre, The Great Fear and the more modest one on revolutionary crowds, published in 1944. The latter emphasized the intermental relations that linked human beings gathered in crowds by being able to assess the situation according to common standards, not only because they belonged culturally to the same world, but because they shared common social and political experiences. The sharing of emotions, that is the regulated simultaneity of emotional reaction, facilitated the formation of the group. Politically speaking, sharing the same emotion amounted to uniting a group. And by the same reasoning, sharing emotion produced collective emotion that was sometimes explosive and led to riots. The French history of emotions was more concerned with social bodies than with individual subjectivities, or more precisely, the one did not go without the other. This is undoubtedly the first major gap between the American and French tradition. On the one hand, it is a question of knowing how the individual can protect himself from emotional impositions or negotiate this imposition in a harmonious way or not. And on the other hand, it is a question of understanding how emotions are social facts linked to common experiences that shape the group. Obviously, it would be unreasonable to make the question of emotions a separate issue within political history and even less so within the history of the French Revolution. This was an event where questions of emotion obsessed the most radical revolutionaries who recognized that sensibility can be for the event validating the people and their way of thinking to a point of considering these sentiments indispensable to patriotic citizens. In that sense, centralist theory preceded the manifestation of events, constructing a way of privileging the people and their collective thinking. This, this of course, led others to consider the revolutionaries and their ideas as dangerous for the stability of the executive power. This is why, we can agree one on one fact. Not only should we not consider that the history of emotion has nothing to say about revolutionary political history, but it is a kind of epistemological error to separate them. But there is a second gap that is being played out between the Anglo-Saxons and the French. 
that of alliances with interconnected and associated disciplines, cognitive psychology on the Anglo-Saxon side, psychoanalysis or Freudian-inspired psychology, psychology on the French side. Using images from two films, I would like to dwell on a few precise revolutionary moments that demonstrates this intersection of questions around democratic criteria between political history and psychoanalysis. This is important, I think, because I am one of these people who is sympathetic to the viewpoint that the French Revolution, even in its most controversial period, offers a laboratory for thinking and acting democratically for or against the revolution. To do this, I will analyze three questions. Firstly, the question of identification with leaders and a leader using this as a way of intensifying emotional ties in order to better manipulate their followers. This helps to elucidate the gap between populism and democracy. That is to say, loving a living being who leads you or loving the laws that symbolize you is not exactly the same thing for a whole people or population. Secondly, the question of the place given or denied to women and the feminine in politics and society, which is indeed a point of departure for understanding democratic or anti-democratic, how to interpret the imaginary and the revolutionary experience. Finally, the question of the care given to the sensitive quality of the social body, in as much as this collective feeling and sensory response underpins the community of affections and creates the very possibility of a deliberative space, a court of opinion based on experience. Why is it so important to maintain revolutionary sensibility? This is a fundamental question today, when representative democracy is often criticized and criticized for no longer taking into account this sensitive competence to debate the just and versus the unjust. Well, capturing the love of the people, the question of identification. Michelet blames Robespierre for capturing the emotions of women who would have changed idols or turned themselves into bigots for love of this charismatic figure. But even if women adored Robespierre, is it the responsibility of the one who is adored? Or is it the great difficulty of changing a political emotional regime? No doubt the same woman loved the king and from 1789 to 1795, they sought to reattach their affections to another political body or leader, an incarnation as we say today. This is important, I think. Danton, Robespierre, those very four who are the voice of the people and who present themselves as such when the voice of the king has disappeared from the Republican formula, Vox Populi, Vox Dei. The whole question is how politicians react to this demand to be object of worship and personal identification, whether they stir it up or moderate it. And if they alternately do both, we need as historian to try to understand the logic of this balancing act. On 25th March 1792, Paris celebrated the arrival in power of the patriotic ministers from the Jacobin at a grand civic banquet. An account tells us, the appearance of Mr. Fétion threw in a new interest at the end of the meal. He was received like a loving father at the family banquet. A conqueror of the Bastille, giving in to his enthusiasm, swore on behalf of his comrade loyalty to the beloved Meyer. 
I quote, this oath of fidelity evokes the patron who defended the idea of putting the king who fled on trial in July 1791. It suggests the patron who punished the person responsible for the massacre on the Champ Mars and thus alludes to another meal taken to govern and mourning the picnic of July 1791. This celebration of Republican life at this civic banquet with a mayor coming to sit at the people's table is reversing the scenes of Republican mourning that followed the Champ de Mars shooting. It is a possible new Republican birth. Loyalty to the mayor is loyalty to the Republic, but Pétion refuses to embody this loyalty and gives everyone present at the banquet a lesson of political theory. Citizen, Pétion cried, I quote, it is not to a man that you must swear loyalty. It is to the nation, it is to the constitution. He then withdrew amidst the applause and blessing of a huge audience. The mayor pronounced a lesson of disincorporation of the symbolic investment in favor of the invention of a collective body that could not be represented the united people or nation and of a symbolic body, the law. And he did that while the world festival around him seemed to offer a procession of incarnated embodiment invoking the paternal figure derived from the figure of the good kings who were in their turn good fathers of the people and who transferred those characteristics to their magistrates. Pétion, enunciate a new political necessity, that of renouncing one's own judgment because of the loyalty to a beloved magistrate. The affective bonds of fidelity and political love must and so forth be reserved for that which founds the social bond. The existence of a sovereign nation founded on the existence of laws Free men live under laws, they are free thanks to these laws. They must therefore not be faithful to men, but faithful to laws. At the heart of this celebration of free life under laws, the political lesson allows us to grasp the gap between a political life that would do without bodies and would be a mortal abstraction and a political life that would give its place to bodies and emotional ties as a symbolic presence of the law themselves. It is no longer laws against bodies, but the multiple free and singular bodies in the party, such as the presence of laws. The fort pour la patrie or breaths of the patrons read a discourse animated with the purest and most ardent civic spirit. Fervor and purity refer to the brief and the earth. The pure brief is opposed to the vitiated brief, the burning earth to the dying earth. As with Rousseau, the metaphor of the earth expresses both the affectivity and the principle of political life. If this principle is absent, the body politic dies. As soon as the earth has ceased to function, the animal is dead. The free city presupposes citizens attached to earthly life, that is to say, attached to the laws that make it possible to have a good life. This pure and ardent civism expresses the vitality of the political body, an immanence of the earthly good, the insistence on the singularity of each speaker's point of view, could lead to fear in the face of the dangers of disintegration of a political body where each would have an opinion only representing that of his own judgment. But the festival connects multiple points of view without merging them. The people's body remains a multiple body. No magistrate can take his place. He can only take a place among all citizens. Pétion Farrafor, refuses to capture the emotions of the people as a chief, he remains in the position of an appreciated magistrate and asks the people to love themselves as the embodiment of the sovereign legislator 
to love the laws it produces. You will tell me that everything goes wrong in 1793, 1794, because the revolution experiences very real political failures that anger Pio Varenne, worry Sanjus, but also Robert Spierre, in fact. In 1791, Pio the author of the Asepocacy, explained the difference between democracy and anarchy, where doing without a king is concerned. Why revolutionary people have to do a constitution without a king or even a chief? I quote, will you remain free for a long time with a leader who is impatient to chain you up? or who will harness the ascendancy of sovereign power, all the means of intrigue and seduction, and the effects of the weakness of peoples, who can ignore the fact that as soon as a man is above the level, all the others fall at his feet. He speaks of the propensity for voluntary servitude. Bio Varenne also considered that only those who know only the law as their master are truly free nations. He added that freedom is only uh, proven if no one can break it with impunity. Whatever the constitution of a government may be, if there, if there is only one man who is not subject to the law, all the rest are necessarily at the discretion of that man. Finally, when war is the focus of attention and the leader can be a victorious and glorious warrior, the danger increases. In year two, Bio Varenne fears that with war, a great military strategist will stand in the way of the very possibility of democracy, that the people will rely on such a military genius and willingly give up their prerogative and sovereignty. In this, he remains absolutely adjusted to his theory of asipocracy. There must be no aid, no captain, no leader. He thinks that federal government, that is to say not centralized and powerful police entry, is the best form of government. Also, if he ardently defends the legislation necessary in times of great danger, such as the period of terror, if factions are slaughtered, shouldn't we find a less vertical political regime? Part vertical identification. Saint-Just also thinks that more power should be given to the communes. And there, again, there is a race to be won because otherwise, how to ensure a democratic future for the Republic? Robespierre professed the same fear in times of war military power and executive power gain ascendancy. Citizens are less concerned about loving freedom. He explained this on several occasions in his text on war. However, his opponents reproach him for having become a dictator of opinion, for having too much influence. This is undoubtedly true but does he take advantage of it? His melancholy, which makes him <clears throat> leave his post split, his melancholy, which makes him leave, post splits for him. His passion for revolution is not a passion for power. He does not enjoy it. As for the nine of Termidor and the ultimate desertion of the saint Claude in front of the city hall, where he is locked up with his friends, this can be interpreted, interpreted in several ways. Either this dictatorship had already seized and therefore did not have the importance it was denounced for having, or Robespierre did not use it and he was therefore not the dictator we thought he was. In fact, he seems to have either lost the love of the saint Claude or refused to manipulate it, refused to turn it on the assembly. If the love of an, of an incarnation remains possible as a residual in revolutionary society, those who could benefit from it do not. 
there is indeed a ban on populist capture of the sword that echoes the Ancien Regime. Let us credit this to the revolutionary moment. Speaking for the people can be captivating, but offering one's word does not lead to capturing for oneself the love that may have been shown towards the nation for promoting laws that protect this sovereign people. The identification takes place, but revolutionary work repeatedly to diffuse it by challenging it, by proposing over identification, and more particularly identification with the law and with the multiple figures of this law people. The law therefore recommends against the possible disembodiment of the paternal function upon magistrates and citizens, and in doing so, it lessens the possibility of multiplying fathers who are not only devoid of all power, but fragile and vulnerable, like all living human beings. Second, I want to examine how orienting emotion and what to do with women. In a book entitled La Révolution Fratricide, the psychoanalyst Jacques André described the revolution as, I quote, an original scene where the Sophius recreates himself. And therefore, it is a moment of considerable excitement requiring a work of liaison and control commensurate with the forces at work. According to him, tying this impulsive excitement consists in giving women neither the nocturnal power of excessive pleasure that distracts men from public affairs, nor the exorbitant power of abusive mothers, however allegorical they may be. The highest degree of circus, according to Jack André, leads to the control of the feminine, whatever it may be. Let us add that in order to control the feminine, it is not necessary to kill the father, but to give him a place diminished by the control of the law. The father, in that sequence, refers to the king according to the law, in the period from 1789 to Varennes. 1793 is, according to this theory, almost savage because he described it as being at the lowest degree of this necessary impulsive link. The erotic homosexual love, present from the very beginning with the of, of Jeu de Paume, switches to deadly homosexual love because the king has been killed and no longer restrains the female impulses at work in the social world. Alone, in the face of freedom, justice, homeland, law, the republic, so many concepts allegorized in female figures of mother goddesses, one may have to kill the friend who was betrayed. Death locks. And as the investment of the public image is made at the price of a disinvestment of the multiple private spaces, women are furious. They must therefore be controlled much more and confined to their role as mothers and wives and not treated as equals. In this construction, Jacques André does not take sufficiently into account the time between June 21st, 1791 to January 21st, 1793, or the time when the Republic is in its formative stage. I believe that this period is nevertheless important. Let's go back to the feast of March 25th, 1792, when the Jacobins of the Brissotin movement of the new ministry celebrated their victory with the Parisians. This victory was the victory of the Jacobins fight against the immigrants and the rebellious priests, but also within the Jacobins themselves the victory of the warmongers against the pacifists. The feast is a feast of warlike enthusiasm. The impulsive excitement is tied to the war. Now, it so happens that the most explicit and striking discourse in this respect is that of a woman. 
Terrain de Méricourt, who urged the women of the suburbs to take up arms to go and fight like men, first really becoming their equals and obtaining equal glory. I quote, let us arm ourselves as we are entitled by nature and even by the law. Let us show men that we are not inferior to them in virtue or courage. It is clear that the death that comes with war and turns heroes into corpses is already lurking. But this threat does not dampen enthusiasm for war. Only the pacifists talk about it and try to hold back the unbridled excitement. Yet, it is interesting that these warlike speeches held in a fraternal society, including both sexes, takes class, place within a celebration that ends with a touching incident. On the other side of this bellicose excitement, we find the evocation of two female figures, the woman in labor and the birth of her daughter, announcing the birth of a new era. I quote, the wife of a drummer from this tower was in labor the day before. The husband was at the feast. It was thought that the best way to finish it was to attend the baptism of the child. She was a girl. She was baptized and named Pétion National Pic, and her father took the civic oath on her behalf. This child's name is not Marianne, but we understand that this strange first name is a metaphor for the Republican expectation evoked by this piece. Pétion is a tribute to the name of the man who under this Republican loyalty, the Republic must be confused with the sovereign nation and to protect itself, and the baby girl must expect to arm herself with a pike. What can we conclude from all this that takes place well before the fateful break of August 10th, 1792, which is supposed to turn erotic homosexual love into deadly homosexual love? That, if there is a break, it is not so clear cut. And in fact, the question of gender equality does not produce mortification, or really, not only. Death is not staff of by war, death, love, or even fear of division, nor by such ways of dealing with it as, for example, the will to unite and invent festive guest gesture to control the death that lurks around. Likewise, the law of the tutelary goddesses, law, homeland, republic, produced neither political and social frigidity, nor the withdrawal from the private sphere in favor of a cruel public sphere of exigency. Here, everything is linked. The republic is the immanence of its not, where powers are numerous and limited in their power, where there are bonds of friendship between men and men, but also between men and women, like Tinsu and Tenwan, bonds of love between men and women, valued because they give birth to children, to posterity, ties of love, and between Amazonian women and women, between men and men. But this very multiplicity of friendly, fraternal links, masculine and feminine, paternal and maternal, suggests an original scene open in social possibilities. Finally, the imminent sacredness of the people, far from evacuating the feminine, pays homage to it. The woman who gave birth the day before is certainly absent, but there are many women around the cradle of the little girl of the people. Pregnant, wom pregnant women were portrayed whipping Lafayette's bullets, Another pregnant woman, very much alive, and in the form of an ordinary woman, gives birth to the Republic. The goddesses of revolution are not allegorical female bodies represented, but bodies of living, breathing women that are allegorized. And they can be found in village festivals, just as Michel Vauvel has shown. For the end, taking care of the sensitive, the ardor, the desire. As early as 1789, 
89 in the debate that animated the Constitutional Committee charged with drafting the Declaration of Human and Citizen Rights, the sensitive dimension of the feeling of oppression was terrorized. terrorized. Sensitivity was then considered to be both a divine and revolutionary faculty. As with the Rousseau of the Confessions, one must feel in order to know in proof. In the first, an honest earth is the first organ of truth. He who has felt nothing can learn nothing. And for Robespierre, I feel, I feel that I am free and that this freedom commands. But if the voice of truth is indeed that of some kind of sensitive intuition, the latter can be disturbed by the revolutionary event itself. There is in every revolution a clash of times and a discontinuity of places in politics that leads to a fragility of experience on which the sovereign decision must be based. And therefore, the sensitive intuition as a necessary compass can itself be perverted, diverted, damaged. Some consider that the greatest damage caused by the counter-revolution, the terror that opposed it, was the erosion of the sensibility of citizens. This destroyed not only their ability to judge, but also their capacity to build a society based on civic trust. It is in this context of that subjective uncertainty that Saint Just wished to establish affection at the basis of the social bond. For him, it was a question of avoiding discontinuity and uncertainty without, however, relinquishing individual responsibility. For him, this responsibility was the valued core of sensitive experience, and it is for this reason that experience is destined to be translated into laws and morals. How can we make citizens responsible even for their emotions? With new civil institutions, whose function is to divide the social body, to repair the sensitive damage by the radical confrontations and months of factional struggles. To be virtuous is therefore to listen to the voice of one's sensibility and to be guided by it in order to make this full earth even in solitude. No resistance to oppression is possible without this subjective sense of alarm or emotional reaction against injustice. This assumption underpins the religion of civic, civic duties and the celebration that, that go with it. The Decade of Feast, implemented starting from the 18th of L'Oréal year two, a learning of the normative emotion by festive incorporations. Songs, theater, poetry, emotive scenographies, aiming to create a kind of people's theater to produce these sons and daughters who revel in the name of the father. It is no surprise to find in this dramatization a valorization of the affective bond of family. Celebration will be instituted in honor of pudor, love, marital love, paternal love, maternal tenderness, filial pity. These decadal celebrations also lead to the extension of the work of political transmission and civic education, with celebration for love of the fatherland, hatred of tyrants and traitors, glory and immortality, friendship, courage, good faith, heroism, happiness. All social feelings are valued without being truly attributed to either sex. If the year two is not an easy time for women who are relegated to the maternal side of the Republican equation, Saint Just in the fragment speaks of daughters brought up with their mother, of a male teacher or institutor and not of female institutrice. It first seems far removed from a Condorcet, but nevertheless admits that the speech of the woman has acquired some credit. In the same work, Saint Just writes, women cannot be censored, and a girl has the right, has the right to ask for another guardian in the temple 
without explaining the reason, Republican men can no more with women than with men exercise measure of outright power or domination. Finally, the institution of guarantees affirm equality of sex and age. Every citizen, regardless of age and sex, who does not hold any public office has the right to accuse in the criminal courts a man of authority who has been guilty of an arbitrary act against him. If that deceives a girl shall be banished. If that beats a woman shall be banished. Saint Just's conception of marriage also deserves attention. While he initially opts in the editorial floor of the fragments that spouses will separate after seven years if they have not had children, a little further in this work, he affirms that the man and woman who love each other as spouses. If they have no children, they can keep their secret commitment. Love first come out of the Republican institution, which is only interested in filiation. While it terrorized as early as 1792, the fact that ties are founded on needs and affections, what does he conclude? That it is necessary to fear the situation where a woman gets tired or disgusted in short, where the desire disappears and that the other is no longer present in a relationship. To be happy with women, you must make her happy without making her aware of your efforts. Leave her absolutely free without the illegible word there. And he goes on to say, whoever wants to make a woman happy must leave her to herself. And he says that he will not risk disgusting her by too much haste. Leave her always wanting. This way of constituting a de facto marriage outside the institution testifies to the need to take into account in a new and acute way the question of desire who rolls in the bonds he seems to be discovering. The love between a man and a woman is therefore not a simple impulse, nor a necessary civic affair. It requires place and finesse. In his notebook, he stages a languid scene where the loved woman comes, but that is sad and mute. She takes part in the pleasure of a a friend that does not taste the pleasure for herself. This woman explains her sadness by saying, I quote, you want me to follow you. I can never resolve to do that. I promise to engage in your endeavors and commit to your advancement. Then we we'll see, but I'll never be able to resign myself. The lover then proposes proposes a separation to spare himself more regrets and says that he will take another woman with whom to have children. It is however self-evident that if the wife must follow the husband according to the norm of the time, then how can they hope to have children if desire is no longer present? She weeps. They declare their love again, promise each other they will find each other soon, and she ends up wondering if she is different or jealous or if she has a plan she does not dare to admit to. The torment are not those of love, but those of the uncertainty of desire in spite of love. This scene is very melancholic and the loss of order resembles that of the revolution, which Saint Just describes as icy, using the metaphor of a woman who gets cold but is awoken by the slightest fire. But above all, it disrupts a conception of the couple that is completely determined by the family in this moment of great fragility of the social civic bond and the playing out of roles decided by a supposedly newly rediscovered nature is no longer enough. New attention must be paid to share desire as a guarantee of invigorating life.
and well-being. The lessons of Saint Just are that women think and feel. Their words and their movements must be respected if Republican men want to be able to live with, love, and even protect them. They must listen to them and therefore listen to them even in their difference. In this respect, a, re a revolution of morals has indeed taken place and at its core it concerns the recognition of a fact that the patri or homeland is a community of affections and to make the revolution presupposes thinking about the way in which emotions are linked and organized. If they are too excessive, they could destroy the long-awaited city, but if they disappear, it would be to let the city die of longer and neglect. The sharing of the same normative emotions after the historical denaturation is no longer only natural. It is the product of a common experience, of a common education that can lead to the activations of emotions as a faculty to judge together a fact, a situation, a history. The patriarchy needs to find ways to include women who refuse to follow their husbands or refuse to be only mothers. Some men knew this and were already struggling with what remained to be invented. The acceptance of a mismatch between gendered bodies and gendered emotion and the impossibility of prescribing emotion and social roles without taking into account the experiences of each and every one. To know how to deal with all the complex emotions that involve desire will be to reform the polity in its manners and morals. Then a real deliberative space could unfold. This is the utopia of the fragment of Republican institution. Social relations will be at the foundation of the democratic social fact. Individuals capable of thinking their happiness and producing an art of making society in the process, making the polity. Two films addresses this issue. Dominique Cabrera's film, Le Beau Dimanche, Beautiful Sunday, which stages July 17th, 1791, and questioned the sensitive links between Republicans when the king betrayed. The second is the Pierre Scholler's film, A Nation, A King, it highlights this new effective presence of women in the city. That's why you saw the women in these films during this conference. Thank you. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you for such a, a, a wonderfully deep presentation that I think makes us all feel, and I'm sure I can speak for everybody here, that why we are so fascinated by this period. And in explaining a little bit more about how the, um, oh, sorry, stop my video. Um, how the, the scenes trying to bring in that emotive uh, aspect. So I won't say to you more about that for the, for the moment, but I just want to say about questions. Um, please submit a question as we did last week via the chat um, uh, facility. And if you would like to come on screen, just send a, uh, a question to David Smith at H France, and we will allow you to come on screen. And after a brief identity check, you can ask your question. Um, so the, that, that is the pattern, either just straight on the chat and I will read them out, or um, sending a message in the chat window uh, to the host. But the, uh, the first question uh, is, I'm going to hand it back to, to Peter McPhee to take advantage of the time when other people are thinking about their questions. But I would just like to particularly thank Sophie for a wonderful presentation that I'm sure all of you appreciated. So over to you, Peter, and think about your questions and send those up as we're doing this. Oh, thank you, Kirsty. And Sophie, thank you very much for such a stimulating and interesting paper. Uh, I want to ask you a question about uh, the words that people use to express their emotions. You make the point uh, that there are important cultural differences in the way that people express emotions. There are differences in the way that 
historians understand emotions. Uh, but I'm wondering what you would say about the problem during the French Revolution of the sincerity of people's emotions or the authenticity, because certainly uh, in the year two, uh, there is a great tension between people who had been very close friends and who, ex and who try to express their emotions of affection, of sincerity, of loyalty to the Republic, and yet there are people who doubt their sincerity. So it seems to me that one of the issues for the historian of emotions is this whole question of the authenticity or the sincerity, the transparency of the language that people use to express their feelings. Do you have comments to make about that? Yes, of course. It's a, thank you very much, uh, Peter McAfee, for this question. Uh, I think it's a, a, reflexive, a reflexive question for revolutionary people because uh, at the first moment of the revolution, they, they believe it's, the sincerity is possible because they think it's not a question of uh, to have a mask, but a question to have a body. And you can't uh, express your body. So your body express something. You have to express with the body and you are uh, going to believe the, the language of the body. And at the very beginning, it's the, the way to understand what is sincerity is the language of the body. And after, uh, in the second time, uh, even uh, Robespierre doesn't think uh, it's pos possible to uh, maintain the imaginary of purity of the, even the body. You can uh, uh, use your body uh, like in the curve before, use your body to make the persiflage or use your body to uh, uh, put the adversary in a trap or something like that. So you have to think of the education even of emotion because they believe uh, emotion is the, the fact you, you need to be able to understand very quickly a situation. So they don't, uh, for the, the revolutionary who are involved in uh, that kind of uh, theory of uh, emotions uh, as a tool for politics, they, they don't abandon the, uh, the tool, but they want to uh, accurate the tool. They want to, to aggise the, the capacity of the people uh, to be able to to feel the reality, so they they have to denounce the insincerity of the opponent, and they have to educate uh, the capacity of the people. So it's not easy in the sources, and you have to to take in account. Uh, the discourse about the discourse is about that uh, sincerity and the insincerity for s somebody like Saint Just. It, it looks like civil war, in fact, because when you uh, are not in a, in a way to understand the situation with sincerity and with uh, the other people to to be in a deliberative way of. Uh, examine a situation, you are in a, um, a struggle who is not an ordinary struggle, but a way to don't take care of the other. So you are not in a revolution league. Thank you. I think if I can just ask a question while we go, uh, while they come through, because people are obviously thinking about this. And feel free, please feel free to, uh, to answer in French, Sophie, if you would like a break. Um, do you think that the the process of expression is is difficult because the falsehood comes in in the process of expression, just like the when the law, the difference between the law being legislated and the law being applied. So there is this kind of 
the practice, the performativity is a problem in the revolution. Do you think that's the case? Uh, the difference between uh, the performativity of what? Of the, of the people or the performativity of the laws? Of both, because in fact there's a parallel between the, the level at which the emotions are, um, that, that the emotions begin and the purity with which the emotions begin, and then the complexity of them melting down through the legal process and being applied, um, and the division that that creates as they are being applied. Okay. <laughs> Don't worry. un tout petit peu parce que là je suis pas sûre de comprendre I think that the film shows that the nuances of these relationships so well. It, it is able to sort of show how the politics is complex. I think that there is no possibility to just to apply when you are uh, sincere. It's a, it's a way to judge the situation. And uh, so when you, you speak about uh, applying, I, I'm not sure to understand in fact. Applying, applying what? It, it, that's interesting because even when Madame de Souza was, was giving her son advice, she said people had a reputation for being sincere. So people began to trust that your, your, your words and your um, approaches were sincere. But uh, I, I think uh, we, we can't uh, meet the people. So we when we are an historian you you meet uh, just the, the the discourse about the people and sometimes you have little pieces of the uh, real speeches of uh, of the people so what we, what i know is from the petitions and the way they make petitions and even in the petitions it's a way to translate emotions to words and when you have to translate emotions to words you want to, to give a, a sensation to, to the legislator and you want to speak about anger or speak about uh, enthusiasm or speak about uh, fear or pity or you want to, to them to feel compassion. So you organize the discourse to obtain the possibility of uh, intersubjectivities uh, with emotions. And it is a, a way to uh, organize the unity between the legislators and the people. But there are um, uh, speakers for the people. And even in a, a petition, we can't say if it is the people who are as uh, imaging the, the world uh, himself. We don't know. Right, absolutely. We'll just get back to Peter because he's got another question. Um, if you could just put your um, video on, Peter. Yes, if I, if I can take the opportunity to ask a, another question, uh, Sophie. I want to ask about the um, whether uh, when we look at some of the correspondence uh, between revolutionary leaders, uh, the expressions of affection uh, need to be understood as uh, in a way, a formula, or whether they were sincere expressions of affection. I was very, uh, I, I was very struck when I was reading the correspondence between Robespierre uh, and Danton, for example, and Desmoulins, uh, as well as other people, that uh, often there were very effusive, very profound expressions of love uh, between these men. Uh, some historians have argued that such expressions were not sincere, that they were just a formula, uh, whereas I took them as being sincere expressions of affection. And I wonder what you think about this, because certainly uh, friendship at that time seems to have been expressed very often in uh, profoundly emotional terms. Uh, is that is your reading of that uh, that these are sincere expressions of affection or just the way that people uh, wrote their letters? Yeah, of course. When you speak about formula, it's a way to say there is a culture 
of uh, um, showing what are your emotions and uh, to express very uh, um, uh, easily the the emotions you should have. Uh, so there's there's a culture there's something in the level of the structure because it's a conquest after the 17th uh, century and after the court to express the the pathos so you have to express the pathos if you want to show you are a, a real uh, sensible man sensitive man so if you want to be uh, uh, up to date you have to be sensible if you are revolutionary. And the ontology of insensibility is for the aristocratic people who don't mind about uh, killing a young uh, uh, boy because uh, the horse is not well uh, um, dressed. So I, I think, uh, of course, I do agree there is a culture and we can't know if it is just a culture of if they feel in their mind or in their heart the reality of that kind of uh, friendship. We can't know. But I think it's the same and the opposite. When you have something very uh, icy, you don't know if it is a, a way, uh, as a formula of pudor, of it it is really a uh, icy relationship between uh, uh, spouses, for example, when one is dying and you have to stay stoic in the court in the 17th century. So it's not uh, a, a question for historians. You can't go through the, the, the text and you have to take into account we have change of culture and I think it's something every historian of emotion on the uh, 18th century uh, do agree with that. There is a culture for emotions. But after, the question is, uh, why is it so important politically to express friendship? And it's another question. And to, to express the friendship politically, it's a way to, to, to think uh, the community of polit politics, of citizens, uh, needs that kind of uh, first affection. If you don't have that uh, little uh, um, uh, uh, little group because of affection, as uh, said uh, Saint-Just, everybody is independent. He can live alone. But he has love and uh, friendship, and because he feels love and friendship, he will meet other people who are independent. And then he organizes first little group, and this little group makes society. So you need friendship because if you want to organize a society, you need to valorize, valorize uh, affections because it is affection who make the link between people. So you don't believe it's only the uh, uh, intellectual link who are uh, useful for making a good society. And that's why you have to express your friendship, you have to express your love, even with unfaith, but it is because it's the, the need of being a good revolutionary to be able to make links between people. And to, to that kind of links are not links uh, for all the life. You can be uh, disappointed by somebody. And then you have to explain why. And it is very sad to, to, to leave a, a friend, but you have to explain why you have to leave a friend. Sometimes you have to. You can have to leave a friend because you have observe is not a good person with the woman. And then you don't want to be in the same group of a Batman who is not a good person with the woman. And so you want to 
uh, are distanced with him because it's not the good values uh, to be in a revolutionary society. So you have to express it and then you can uh, disrupt with the friendship. So friendship is very important, but as a way to organize the link between people in the society. Yes, I very much agree. And I think it also helps us to explain why there was such an emphasis on the principle of uh, publicité, of people expressing their views uh, openly in popular societies. And when they came to vote on particular matters, they had to express their views openly as a way of uh, being transparent about their sincerity, transparent about their emotions. Even uh, when you have to cut with a, a friend uh, for uh, Saint-Just in the Fragment d'Institution Républicaine, it is in the temple. It's very important, so it's sacred. Yes, thank you. Okay, so we've got a question from, um, from Tip Reagan. Thank you for a very stimulating talk. Your point, you point to the differences. Um, sorry, I've just lost the. Um, sorry, Sophie, I just I just lost the. the um, you point to the differences in the Anglo-Saxon and the French historiographical traditions. What do you think accounts for these differences? Are they anchored in different concepts of political culture, sense of individuality or collectivity? And given what's going on in our contemporary world, I think your work speaks to some of the cultural differences we see today, although I know that we as historians are loath to make such connections. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> uh, I think um, both anglo section and uh, French uh, are involved in uh, the question of collectivity, but not in the same way. I think for uh, Anglo-Saxon, the question of uh, collectivity is uh, how the collectivity oppressed the individuality and for the, emo the emotions particularly. And I think it's uh, one of the uh, most important uh, uh, st statement of uh, William Reddy work. And for, for me, individuality is important, but as a metaphor of the group, because each person is a representant of the group. And you can't imagine, and maybe I am like uh, Norbert Elias, you can be a real individual without thinking in, in which group you, you, you are in your life. So you, you do, we don't have real, real individualities. Individualities, it's uh, some personalities who have subjectivity, but even the subjectivity belongs to a group and you have to accept the belonging to the group to be, to be, to be a man, to be a woman. And if you don't uh, accept it, you are something like, uh, 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 when you are um, uh, foolish. So I think the difference is, is not on individuality and collectivity, but the way we look at the individuality and the, look, the way we look at the collectivity. Collectivity for me is quite oppressive for uh, Anglo-Saxon world. And, uh, and we, I think, on the section, believe there is real individual. And I think when we work on uh, societies uh, in, in the French tradition of uh, history of mentalities, we have to think uh, of the individual into the group, member of the group, and representation of the group. That's why I can explain what happened with the, the woman uh, in the sad uh, scene. It could be just individualities, but in fact, they are a metaphor of the situation of the French Revolution. At the end, 
after the struggle of faction. I think I think that that's that's really uh, that, that's really got nicely the, the the difference there between the, the French and the English uh, or the or the Anglo-Saxon approach. We'll go to Roland. He's got a question and he's going to come on screen to ask it. Hello, hello, uh, hello. Uh, I know those books, uh, those shelves behind you very well. Um, <laughs> where you are. Um, it's good to see you. I enjoyed the talk very much, and I have uh, two uh, uh, questions, if I may ask uh, two. Uh, both of them are, asked, are taking you from the French Revolution to today. Uh, one question is about the emotional power uh, of the French Revolution today, in political struggles today. And my reference is that um, I saw on the news today that there was a big demonstration against the prime minister in Israel, in Jerusalem. And what the demonstrators shouted in Jerusalem is Bibi Bastille, which in Hebrew sounds funny, like bringing together Bibi and Bastille, right? Bibi Bastille. So clearly, I know it, they're doing it because it's Bastille Day, which I understand that, but clearly uh, the French Revolution as a foundational myth of modern political struggles still has a lot of emotional power in political conflicts today. And I would like you to comment on that. That's one question. And my second question is about your emotional connection to the French Revolution. Because I read Dominique Lacapra, who uses psychoanalysis to say that historians have an affective relationship to their subject of research, whatever the subject of research is, they have an affective connection that usually we don't explore, we don't psychoanalyze ourselves. But I am wondering about the um, uh, uh, affective uh, connection between historians of the French Revolution and the French Revolution, or between you and the French Revolution. Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. First, the emotional power of the French Revolution uh, is, uh, is uh, real, but with discontinuities. And I think it's more important now and since the Arab Springs than uh, during the 90s. Uh, and nowadays, if we want to, to look from the Arab Springs to now, now, we have seen the comparison between Bastille Day and the very beginning of each event. And uh, each uh, person compare the first demonstration at the Bastille Day. And uh, so it's a way to say it's the beginning of freedom. And uh, I think it's uh, very emotional and uh, it's something uh, who is uh, uh, very uh, important to maintain the desire of uh, uh, learning the French Revolution, knowing what is the French Revolution, not only the myth, but after some more. For uh, nowadays, uh, uh, we have uh, just uh, last year, the Yellow Vest, who have used a lot of uh, uh, revolutionary imaginary, uh, and uh, they use in a, a way we have to be uh, very uh, careful, I think, because it was both the extreme right, the right, and the, the left. So uh, the same symbols of the uh, red bonnet, or the cocard, or uh, even uh, uh, the, the drapeau, uh, the flag, uh, it was uh, both uh, extreme right and uh, and and the others and uh, and uh, and left, and then we have to understand how the history of uh, of France and the way uh, the aristocratic and the the right uh, go to republic because they don't have choice during the 19th century, organize the possibility of many use of that kind of symbols 
And uh, it's not really new. It was uh, during the uh, 2013, we had the red bonnet in the, the west of France who organized some demonstrations who were quite uh, the same than yellow vest uh, demonstration. So the use of French Revolution is very strange for me because uh, I think it's always about the sovereignty and the people's sovereignty, but not always about emancipation. And uh, it's not the same to have the sovereignty of the people and emancipation. And so we have to understand the different use by the left and by the right. And so I think, uh, yes, there was always emotional power for freedom, but not always emotional, po uh, emotional power for equality. And uh, I think it's not exactly the same. And so we have to work on the pieces of situation to understand what, what they do with the French Revolution. What is the use nowadays of the French Revolution? And I think it's not uh, easy to, to demilie. I, I don't know how to say. Well, my own emotional uh, relation to French Revolution. Uh, I think uh, for me, uh, the French Revolution is uh, the place where we can see with uh, uh, a kind of purity the opposition between uh, the left and the right the aristocratic or the uh, uh, capitalist against the people of the porte parole of the people. And it's very interesting because it's very uh, uh, vigorating. It's very, uh, when you are a little uh, sad of the situation, because I think you can be sad with the coronavirus and <laughs> with many things uh, since a long time now, I think when you are inside the, the text of the revolution, it's very lively. And uh, I, I like that text because of that. And for me, it's of course the, the way of uh, reconnecting with people who believed of uh, France as the land of the freedom and land of the human rights, even if nowadays, we can't say that. So it's a way to, for me to, to be an historian of the French Revolution. It's a way to be able to accept to be just a French woman. And uh, it's, not, uh, it's not bad. Thank you, Rolly. We've got a question from Bill Reddy, um, so we'll, we'll go to that because it, you, you used his work at the beginning of your presentation, Sophie. He's asking you, ethnographic work shows that everywhere communities train themselves, rehearse and learn emotional norms. You speak of this eloquently as important to revolutionaries, but if learning and effort are necessary, how can sincerity be ensured? Do you want to read it again? Um, oh, um, can you can you translate it for me? I will ask. Um, she's la sincérité. Est-ce qu'on peut faire confiance aux émotions? Uh, la sincérité des émotions. Est-ce qu'on peut savoir qu'ils sont sincères? Alors, uh, I think the question is not uh, the sincerity, but the education of emotions. Uh, you can be sincere and be a racist. You can be a, a, a sincere racist. And it's not a question of sincerity. It's a question of education, of a way of thinking. And uh, the, that's why at the end they want to organize incorporation of values because it's not sufficient to have the Declaration of Rights. You need to have the Declaration of Rights in the earth. But to have the Declaration of Rights in the Earth supposed to be educated at that declaration. And so it's a question not of sincerity, because you can say 
it's a, a way to be insincere if you repeat only what you have learned at school and what is the civic norms. But maybe you can have a link between what happened in your earth and what happened in the education. And so if they, they are emancipation and something who improve your life, you know you can be sincere and civic at the same time because you have experienced the, the fact, the revolution had changed your life and in a good way. And of course, it's a very strange struggle, the French Revolution, but many, many people in the, in the lower classes regret after the time of revolution because they were able to be heard, they were able to uh, be interested in what happened, and they can be, uh, they can go to, to popular societies to be together and to speak about politics. And after it was finished, so they knew in their body and in their intelligence what they have uh, done during the French Revolution. So the sincerity came from the experience and the way you uh, are able to think on your experience. And then you can say the question is not only the sincerity, but the norms of the society and the possibility to uh, make a coincidence between your feeling of human, human being. What is a human being? Uh, a human being is somebody who is able to think, who is, is able to speak, who is able to feel. And then, when you are in a society, you have the right to think, the right to feel, the right to speak. You, you are in a, a place of emancipation and to organize your life and to organize the collective life. And then if the, the education goes to what you need for your needs, then your earth and the norms at, are adjusted. And if they are adjusted, when you have sincerity and they are, if they are not and of course it's not so important what is important is the way you obtain the possibility of equality and for equality uh, you have the most uh, uh, the most numerous of the people are for equality We've got a question from Ian. Oh, sorry. The aristocratic people have to be uh, in a melodrama of uh, what they feel because they don't. They are not adjusted at the situation. But for other people, it's in the earth. It's what uh, Robespierre said when he said, uh, "It's easy for the people to be virtuous because uh, he has nothing to to change." But it's difficult for the, the, the important people because they have to change something. It, it gets into a discussion of morality. So uh, Ian's got a question. I'll trust Ian to be developing this, this idea I, of, of the morality of the revolution if he comes on I screen. I will just uh, 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 say something. The question of sincerity is, is an Anglo-Saxon question because it's a question of individual to be sincere or not sincere. It's not the question of, uh, of the collectivity. For the collectivity, you need a little conformism to be able to be with the others. And uh, a conformism to let them feel what they want, but to show you, you believe in the same society. Okay, Ian. Uh, thank you, Sophie. I really enjoyed it. This talk so much and what I found really fascinating was the way in which you were bringing intimacy into the field of political emotions rather than kind of separating them off into these different fields and also taking us away a little bit from the older sense that there was one emotional style that would somehow explain the French Revolution and I liked your Having taught with films a lot myself, I, I, I really enjoyed your, your reference to these films. But I was thinking about another film, which is La Nuit de Varenne. Um, 
And something that I really encountered a lot in my, in, in, in my own studies of the early part of the revolution, which was the kind of collapse of this notion of amabilité as a, as a way of, which is, I mean, it's a kind of a, it seems like an opaque notion, hard to comprehend exactly what was meant by those ideas. And that in some sense, it's to be replaced by a concept of virtue, but then in some sense, virtue collapses. And I guess this is around the, 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 clap, the collapse of any clear faith in, in that you can determine sincerity simply from the body. Um, and I'm wondering whether that gives rise to, to a, a kind of really dangerous period, a crisis, or is it a, a really creative period where, I mean, that also seems to be something that is emerging as, as, as people are reaching for new kinds of emotional technologies, what you call the education of emotion, but you know, I see it as kind of these packages and maybe even thinking of the terror as one of those packages, right? The concept of the terror. Um, but my specific question relates to something that's in La Nuit de Varenne that is not in Un Peuple Sans Roi, that really struck me and was very troubling to me which was the, the presence of the question of race. Un peuple sans roi was just so white. <laughs> and I really appreciated its, its, its treatment of women. But back in La Nuit de Varenne, there was this question of the intimacy of the physical questions around race as well. So I'm just wondering how this work that you're doing and your approach might also help us find ways to integrate these really profound, intimate bodily questions around race into the study of, of revolutionary emotions? Alors, intimacy of what? Intimacy of, of race, yes. Of, of the rights, the rights. No, race, la race. Ah, the, the la race. Couleur. Uh, of the, race. the race. But uh, uh, I think... Um, Race as a racism, race, racism. Race, racism, conceptions around okay. esclavage, you know, okay. the, the yeah, yeah. Girl, these kind of questions. I think, um, first of all, the first article of the uh, French Declaration, Tous les hommes naissent et demeurent libres et égaux en droit, refers uh, both to the ancien regime with the three, uh, uh, the two races, the races of the nobles and the others, and refers to the plantation, where is the only place where you can born as a slave, so not a free man. So I think it's very important in the way of thinking of French revolutionaries uh, to uh, abolish the imaginary of the race. And for say yes, uh, there's a, in the Qu'est-ce que le tiers état? There's a, a piece where he explains we have to abandon as, as a people, we have to abandon the believing of uh, coming from the uh, Gaulois because we want the aristocratic people to abandon the imagination to, to belong to the front and to people who are um, uh, the no, in fact, because they belong to the front. And so he says it's something uh, unacceptable to imagine you are from a race, a different race, and with a different uh, blood. And uh, so it's uh, something uh, not only wrong, but uh, silly to imagine like that, and then we can uh, ask that kind of people to go back to the forest. So the forest, it's not only the forest, it's the place of uh, uh, wildness. So the race and the imagination of race for, uh, say yes, it's wildness. And so they, they believe there is no race, in fact. There is only the unity and universality of uh, human beings. And uh, the intimacy of the, of the race, uh, maybe it can uh, continue for the people 
who are aristocratic or maybe who are slaves because they know what they, they have as they, they had experienced it's not the same life so they know there's something different and they have to 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 make riots to go into insurrection to try to obtain equality and it's very long and very diffi difficult so maybe there is intimacy of race for slaves when they have to make riots and for aristocratic people, but for the other, is something for the past. Of course, they, they haven't uh, win. So we know the race continues after the, the French Revolution. But during the, the, the moment uh, of the end of uh, uh, the legislative to uh, the abolition of uh, slavery, I think, uh, there's uh, many, many revolutionary who think uh, the race is uh, something over. I think if you, if you would permit me, we will draw this to a close and go into the breakout room so that we can keep discussing this. I think it, I'd particularly like to thank Sophie for a, a wonderfully thought-provoking uh, talk for this Bastille Day. I think we'll all go, home, go away and think about these issues of um, emotion, of intimacy, how the collective emotion relates to the individual emotion, uh, and, and how all that filters down into politics. But for the moment, we will do what we did uh, after the first keynote, and that is go into breakout rooms so that everybody can relax and talk and ask a few more questions of Sophie if she wants to. But I would just remind you that it's uh, after 11.30 at night in Paris, so it, it, it's time to relax and to go into that next phase. Um, so for any of you who haven't experienced this already, you'll be put into a breakout room with a group of uh, other people uh, at, at random uh, to, to, to go on discussing. So I'd really just like you to thank Sophie very much indeed for a wonderful presentation on Bastille Day. Uh, I don't think we can clap, but you can put a thumbs up there. Um, and we'll see you in a minute for those who will stay with us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kirsty.